This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Stambaugh, uh, very involved in biotech and one of the founders of Biocom. David Graham, who is responsible for innovation and economic development in the mayor's office. Chuck Pelley, designer extraordinaire. And Stacy Pennington, a person who thinks about place and urban design and creating humanly responsive uh, living and working environments. So I'm just going to start with a question. Larry, you get to start. We'll just go right down the line. We agreed that we'd talk about two questions. Don and his team are really hoping that one of the things that will come out of this is a new social network in the San Diego region, something you could think of as a design alliance among multiple institutions that care about growing this place and making it a better place and, uh, for all of us and a place where our children, and my, in my case, grandchildren, want to come back and live. And so I wanted to ask each of you to kind of weigh in from where you sit in the ecosystem of the region what do you see as the promise of design? Why did you even agree to come and be on this panel today? So Larry, you get to start. As a serial CEO, Hi. and uh, someone that's worked in the life science industry for a lot of years, as well as others, design has been something that I paid a little attention to, but not enough. And recently, some of you may know, the Harvard Business Review made it the front cover and a feature article about the best companies in the world are using design thinking and human-centered design. That's a bit of a wake-up call that that can make a difference in your strategies and your companies. And Design Management Institute went further and studied a lot of companies over a 10-year period and found that those companies that made one of their core values design outperformed the other companies 228%. Now, you'd expect one of those companies to be Apple, and it was but you wouldn't have expected Whirlpool, Target, Starwood Hotels. Design matters. So I'll end with saying, as a board member at Biocom, where we are a trade organization for the Science of Life companies in Southern California, for the first time this year, in our five-year strategic plan, we built in that we wanted to feature design thinking and human centered design as one of the core competencies for life sciences in this region. Why? Because it's a competitive edge. Our scientists, our engineers, design therapies, diagnostics, devices to work. And that's a hard job to make the therapy work on cancer, make the device help you at home. But we don't really build design in at the beginning of all of that. So after we get it approved, then we try to figure out how to make the customer experience work. Where are they going to be using it? In the morning, in the evening, standing up, setting down, when they're awake right away, or when they're ready to go to bed? And so we said that needs to become a competitive edge that this region builds in. And the benefit? Rapid adoption. The customer experience is good and most important for life science companies, compliance. If the customer experience is good, in addition to it works, they'll use the therapy. They'll stay on the device. And that is a competitive advantage. Well done. OK, David, your turn. Man, I'm going to have to try to top that one. So I mean, the, the, the first answer is when you get to share a stage with Mary Walshock, you say, yes, and please. Okay. Uh, this is a, a fantastic panel. It's a pleasure to be here um, from the city. And I think of this from a couple of different um, areas. When it, when it comes to the, the challenges that cities are facing, um, that, that we are all facing globally, 
design has a fundamental aspect to how we get at solving those challenges. And one of the things that's unique, I think, to San Diego that makes the idea of a platform of design uh, so appealing is that we really have a knack for collaboration in San Diego. I think about um, how we've looked forward at different points in time. For example, when UCSD Connect was created, collaborating across universities, business, nonprofits, in and around the tech and startup world, or the life sciences with Biocom, again, now one of the um, largest and most impactful groups collaborating, again, university, business, nonprofits, academia. Um, you, you think about each of these organizations and groups that we put together to become a place of learning from each other and breaking down the walls between our traditional ideas and sharing those ideas. And now if you take that to the idea of a design platform and what you can do with that, rather than those of us who may not be as familiar with design thinking of, well, architects go in this bucket and industrial designers go in this bucket and these folks go in that particular bucket, that there are people working across all of those um, different platforms and applications to try to engage in the civic issues that we're, we're facing. And that's another thing that we do really well in San Diego. The engagement between the city and citizens and those who want to bring their talents to bear to change and transform their community is something that is within our DNA. It's something that gives us a competitive advantage. But at the end of the day, what, what I expect to come from all of this and, and hope to see is an army of designers that can be applied to any of the challenges that we're dealing with. So rethinking our parklet policies or the transportation network or how you're experiencing um, the city's website and, and design. You know, what we're doing to really input the citizen experience into what we're able to deliver to you as a government has a lot of, uh, is a fertile ground, and I think one place that we're very excited to see this platform being leveraged in. Great. Boy. Okay, Chuck. Okay. <laughs> I'm <laughs> popping back to Scott's comment about not enough seats in the audience. And I didn't uh, know if you knew this was one of the tricks we're playing on you as designers. <laughs> <laughs> this is called design thinking. <laughs> and uh, those of us who practice our, our art in bars and dense places, this is a goal. There's not enough seats. Oh, it must be good. I must, uh, <laughs> it's all part of global thinking, and uh, which kicks itself off into a domino effect that you hear because your legs are tired and you maybe missed a few words, will start this domino effect to the few designers that we have here that can start building an alliance, building the first of these domino effects that's going to continue. The, the first is the, the ad hoc designers who make some interesting changes, who bring some attention. And of course, uh, eventually the investment people get curious. What's, what's going on? I spent all my money in Palo Alto. I wasn't really that big a deal. And uh, so this domino effect starts. And once the investors are thinking, then all sky breaks loose. And the other part of building uh, this alliance and to build the city density is a global competition of cities that's emerged. And uh, suddenly we have uh, Auckland uh, competing with Milan, keeping with London, with, uh, and an international competition for the design city of the year. And Absolutely, we want to be in it, and uh, <laughs> we've got the people here to start it, and Mary, uh, it's only, what, four years away? You're right. San Diego can could it. be the design city <laughs> of the year. All right. Okay, Stacey. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm Stacey Pennington. I want to build a little bit on the comments that David Graham made about the importance between the connection of design and civic engagement. I come from a little bit of a different perspective, being an urban planner uh, working on a neighborhood within downtown San Diego called Maker's Quarter. It's about six block area that will, over time, integrate two and a half million square feet of office and hopefully be the future um, of our innovation district in downtown. 
And what's unique to me about the power of design and why it's unique now is more than ever, I feel like citizens and the community want a voice in what the future of their built environment is and what it becomes. And I came from years of practice and uh, within the realm of the overall philosophy that it's a bit of a top-down exercise between the development community and architects and envisioning what works best and then plopping it down and hoping that if you build it, they will come. And what we've seen as a very powerful paradigm shift is that it's really important to shape the boundaries and parameters of what goals and objectives might be for a given neighborhood. You can apply this, I think, across multiple platforms. But then you kind of open source it. You allow the community to hack that model, um, if not for better terms, and become engaged in shaping the future. And in our practice, what that's also allowed is for all the driving forces of the innovation economy to become a critical part of shaping what the future of this neighborhood is. It's opened up doors for phenomenal collaboration. Obviously, it's the opportunity to be up here and speaking again with the Honorable, Honorable Mary Walshock. Uh, it leads to incredible collaboration with the city and David Graham and his office, as well as many other business groups. Um, but in the end, ultimately, it allows for the built environment to have a level of authenticity and, um, and connectivity to the end users that really transform the approach to urban planning and design from that, that top-down approach to a truly a human-centered exercise. Um, and in doing so, you know, we're close to engaging um, 75,000 people in the evolution of this neighborhood. And it's really just been a case study. It's been a bit of a, a complete hypothesis and an experiment. Um, but it's, it's, the fact that it's working out is a testimony to why design matters now and what the community's interest and level of civic engagement and the power of that has in actually shaping some of these really important um, and momentous, uh, momentum-filled initiatives. So we get to have a second question before our time is over. And what I'd like to do is have each of you zero in. All of a sudden, Don's got 20 people and all these networks and all these connections downtown, and there's a big design alliance. What's the first project you walk into the room and say, Don, we need to start working on this tomorrow? What would that be, Larry, in your world? I think educating people more about design thinking and human-centered design to understand how to bring it in really early in the process. I'm, I'm really excited, not only for what Don's doing, this conference, and all of you here. We'd like to see you engage up front when we're thinking about what we want to do and building design thinking right there into the process. So education, awareness, that's what I'd make first. And, and would you say that's not just undergraduate and graduate students, but that's citizens? Absolutely. Okay. Citizens, companies, all of it. Got it. David. Two things, actually, that I can think of that we would do first. Um, and one is leveraging on some successes that we've had. This whole idea of place and space, like the courtyard, where we're able to activate that. I was just in Austin, and they were complaining about not doing that. I would like to be able to see throughout the entire city how can we design spaces and places to really revolutionize that and come up with the tools that we could engage with those local communities to solve those issues? And implicit in what you're saying is public space, yes. right? Integrating public and private space in mm -hmm. important ways. Absolutely. Absolutely. Chuck. Great, David. Building right on that, my pick was mobility. Mm -hmm. I uh -huh. want to get there quickly and in utter comfort and, uh, and at ease. And uh, here we have a chance through a city working with design and architects to get very quickly from one comfortable place to another. And uh, we envision the new world that's uh, of cable cars and moving sidewalks and small devices that you put on your feet. We've got to beat the skateboard. The skateboard seems to be the very best one I can see <laughs> in the city. But uh, we have a wonderful chance to be a, the pioneer city that has the easiest, most mobile mobility in the world. Cool. My turn. Um, I'm going to build upon something that Mary started speaking about very publicly about a year ago <laughs> yeah. um, at an event at Silo, and that is the importance of inclusive innovation. 
Um, we've had the opportunity in Maker's Quarter through uh, some of our initial tenants, including Fab Lab, to really um, shake the model of what economic development looks like and truly connect the dots between the public realm, um, placemaking, community engagement, innovation, um, economic development, and a transformative role in, in um, youth's life in every single demographic across every single part of this great city. And I really think um, it's something that Mary's spoken a lot about um, in terms of what differentiates the uh, potential for downtown and an urban center as an innovation cluster as it relates to the phenomenal role of the Torrey Pines Mesa in shaping the future of our entire region and, by gosh, all of our lives in the world. And so I really would love to see, be able to build upon our efforts in Maker's Quarter, be able to build upon what this uh, conference in itself, itself is achieving and um, try to prioritize the importance of inclusive innovation so that as this um, as these tides kind of move and evolve and elevate, they elevate all of us uh, together in a really integrated fashion. What Stacy's referring to is the danger of when you start to generate an innovation economy, it drives people who don't have the same education and competencies mm -hmm. out. Gentrification. San Diego, because of the proximity to downtown, of uh, Barrio Logan, uh, uh, the Diamond District, Golden Hill, all of those spaces are very closely geographically linked. If we come up with strategies that are inclusive and identify opportunities across those geographies, we end up with an inclusive innovation strategy and maybe curtail some of the uh, problems of gentrification that are happening in Brooklyn, they're happening in Santa Monica, for God's sakes, they're happening in San Francisco. So, Larry, who would you bring in the room? Now, so Don said, yeah, Larry, I'm going to help you uh, build a, an education initiative to create almost a new narrative, right? A, a change the culture of San Diego. Uh, describe some of the people or groups you should, think should be in the room to help do that. Interestingly, Mary, while we were putting together the five-year strategic plan for Biocom, conversations began to emerge during that process with 80 other CEOs wow. that this region, some believe, is starting to become Silicon Valley-like. Not just in Science of Life, but in telecommunications, Internet of Things, digital health, brain science, a, a wide range of, of areas. and. Uh, yet we don't build design thinking in up front in the process. So doing more of this, getting the benefits clear, raising the awareness, and you know whether it's be the university, meetings like this, or designers starting to interact earlier with the, the public and the companies and, and show how this becomes an advantage and we become that Silicon Valley of the South. So you're saying there are already 80 CEOs ready to go. <laughs> there, yes, there are, and uh, they, they uh, intersection helped with that process. Right. And we started the education, and that's the first step. That it's that's important, it's an advantage, and do it early. So, David, who would you put in the room? Well, whoever invented that Staples Easy button, yeah, <laughs> I, I want that person. <laughs> uh, as I'm thinking about the projects that I sort of described, um, there's a few that we are already working on. Uh, one with uh, in and around urban agriculture that we're doing with UC San Diego and, and Keith Pizzoli and a few others. That if we had the tools to really take a lot of this um, data around what the city looks like, where the spaces are, it, it, it's all out there. But collecting that all together and being able to use a series of analytics to say, okay, here are hot spots and here are the partner organizations that are already in there. That sort of compiling of all of that mm -hmm. information doesn't really exist. It's usually through relational networks, and that's important, obviously. But I think there is a, a technological solution here from a bringing all of that data together to then be able to say, okay, here's where we should put our resources. And from the easy button perspective, I feel like that there's a lot of resources coming from the community, from philanthropy. If only you could just say, we'll get this done in six months, here, start, finish, done, and this is what's going to transform. And it's a lot of that work um, that we all struggle with to get just a single project done. 
um, that, that makes it so difficult. So if a designer could help us hack that process, that'd so be helpful. So at your early table, you want data miners, visualizers, right? People who can aggregate data and help interpret it because then you have the information people need to make decisions. Absolutely. Move forward. Cool. I turned, uh, you know, I went bars first. This time I'll go to, to uh, wine, maybe clusters. <laughs> Do you know why companies go to uh, Silicon Valley? Silicon Valley now has areas. When Mary talked about the little areas that we have building around this downtown area, mm -hmm. This is where the intensity grows. And if we can tie these clusters of technology, whether it's medical or sports or fashion or what, into intense clusters and then interface them, then we have the, uh, the domino effect that it can accelerate this city out of a one tech feeling that Silicon Valley has into a, a total design thinking community. So I love the idea of engineers hanging out with fashion yeah. designers. Mm. Seriously. Mm -hmm. yes. Never thought about it that way. So what you're saying is, again, not think out of the box, <laughs> but recognize that there's a wide range of creatives. And if you bring them into the room, interesting things might happen. Yeah. Thank you, Mary. So start with that. OK, yeah. Stacy. Can I set a few tables? Yes. All right. Um, so I live one, in a smorgasbord culture. Lots of tables, <laughs> lots of food. One table would be, um, I think one thing that San Diego is coming of age in right now, which this conference certainly is discussing spot on, is the role of our urban, connected, dense environments in the future of this broader innovation economy and human-centered design economy. And I think that that's a bit of a paradigm shift for our entire region to, as Chuck talks a lot about in terms of the role of the car, to kind of um, get, get out of the car and get uh, walking on the streets, get on transit, having the transit link from downtown to UCSD is gonna be transformative in that role. But that table would be set basically, I think, with some of our leading kind of Fortune 500 companies our anchors in our innovation economy, um, as well as the students, many of whom are here this morning, and that there are already phenomenal programs underway to connect the students of UCSD downtown, connect the students of SDSU downtown, and the work we do at Silo and Makers Quarter, we're constantly doing that. But it would be a kind of a table focused on that discussion explicitly about how to break down whatever the misperceptions are of our downtown urban environment and realize that it's highly open for business and highly progressive and highly connected to the future of how we will all be living our lives. I think another table I would set is actually, it's in a petri dish in and of itself right now in Maker's Quarter, but it's this belief that urban planning um, should more and more be completely through the lens of everything Don Norman's written about for many uh, years and decades, decades, which has been the power of this multidisciplinary design. Um, Truly, when you, if you walk through Maker's Quarter, you have urban gardeners at Smarts Farm, you have the innovators at Fab Lab, you have Fuse Integration, you have Urban Discovery Academy, who's just actually making huge pathways towards the integration of STEAM as an educational platform. They all together are shaping the future of this neighborhood, but that should be built in as a practice fundamentally that shapes our, our built environments. It should be all these different disciplines all the time. And then third would be, um, we've got incredible regional business organizations that all have a slightly different kind of interest and focus and priority, and yet we're so fundamentally aligned. And I think it, it can never be um, overstated how important it is to frequently set that table with all of those leaders and, and identify the importance of the commonality of the goals that we all share and how to promote that region-wide with a couple of areas of focus. So I'm told I have one more question. And I'm gonna start with a comment because uh, to, to stimulate you to think about who's going to invest in the world you're in, UCSD has made a substantial financial and reputational investment. What, what are the companies ready to invest? Are they going to put some of their reputational and financial capital? I'd like each of you to address that. Yeah, I, I think so that Biocom demonstrated that by making it a priority in a five-year strategic plan. 
and the CEOs who participated in it agreed. This needs to be something we pay attention to, put effort into, educate ourselves, and bring in help. Right. And I'll say personally, I hope we get design thinking really quickly because I hear a lot about artificial intelligence coming rapidly. I hope you all designed it so it works for me. <laughs> <laughs> the, the willingness to invest is a willingness to sort of open up who and what we are to allow your creative talent to work through the issues that we're dealing with. Whether it's the city's open data platform, we're looking at beginning to pool more information and data from multiple different regulatory agencies, whether it's city parcels, like what happened at Courtyard. You know, starting that conversation, we don't always know what you have to offer and you don't know what we have to offer. And so yeah. being able to have a connected platform we can go to to bring these challenges, to bring these questions, uh, I, I think will be a major part of the investment. And then from there, you know, the, the ROI doesn't always have to be a, a financial bottom line. I like to think oftentimes of what we're doing is beyond the business case. Yeah, you have to make a case to the taxpayers, but what is the new and different and important public service that's being delivered by this particular investment? And if we can make that a, a part of the conversation, if we can make that point, and if for those of you living in San Diego can make that point to your friends and neighbors and others and help folks begin to see the importance of this, I think that's where we get a, a cultural shift and change in our thinking about what, what government should be investing in. Uh, we have companies going to Austin, to Seattle, and so on, just so they can hear what's going on. These, these uh, pioneers don't do much from, sorry, a little biased, but uh, they do listen. They listen in restaurants to what's happening, what's hot. What's, uh, what's, what's so uh, uh, exciting about what's happening in Seattle? I know they have an airplane company, but to, why are they sending people to listen and to try and understand what's happening? And that's the mystery that uh, I hope that the city can create. Hey, we're just poor little uh, talented people, and maybe you come and help us out and uh, <laughs> bring a little something along when you come. So uh, we're on the cusp of, of building a mystery and a uniqueness that's, that's really unique globally. All right, who's going to invest? Um, well, again, a year ago at Context Volume 2, which was at Silo and Mayor was a part of it, we had this very uh, honest, I think, discussion about how uh, vibrant urban neighborhoods transform with all of this in mind. And there was a model discussed, which is one I think about a lot with uh, regards to the future of Maker's Quarter, which is the importance of having, um, you're never going to sustain a million square foot new innovation hub in an ur urban environment with just all the little amazing organic, you know, authentic homegrown guys, right, and gals, right? It's got to be counterbalanced with having the investment and the vision of some of the larger, more institutional, um, bigger corporate, sometimes giants, sometimes just bigger, uh, with high credit um, type of tenants. And so I guess who's going to invest into making this vision a reality and actually, again, connecting all of these dots? It's not only kind of the sweat equity that's already fully vested right now by a lot of amazing, passionate people, many of whom are in this uh, audience today who are uh, just committed to making this vision a reality, but it's also kind of a call to our region and our entire coast and our entire nation as to who wants to champion the actual realization that this, this town, San Diego, is so full of creativity and such a dynamic force and is so yet to even be fully explored and recognized and realized and actually put their flag into becoming a part of um, making all of this a reality. And there, so, and, and just to kind of cut to the chase, for us, it's really a, a, a large tenant that fully aligns with the vision and Got gets it. it. Uh, we'll come. Best speed dating event I've been a part of. <laughs> Thank you all. It's 30 minutes. Thank you, Mary. Thank you.